everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Jegna and the Thinker. I am one of your co-hosts Brennan and I'm joined with Aaron. Aaron how you doing today man? I'm blessed man. What's going on B? How's everybody doing out there? Hope everybody's having a great time. How you feeling? How's the family? Uh, hey man I'm feeling good. The family's good. I am expecting my third child. I don't know Ooh. if it's a boy or a girl yet. Yeah we're adding to the little click that we have here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm praying to the creator that I get a, I get to have that father experience with a son. But if I don't, you know, I'm going to save some dollars because I got a whole lot of girl stuff to pass on down to this next child if it ends up being a girl. But I'm doing good, man. Well, a.k.a. what Brandon just said is that he has no voice in his house because nobody <laughs> listens to him. <laughs> I'm married to a black woman. You know yeah, what I'm Yeah, <laughs> yeah and all, this, all, that, all that sister girl energy you get in yeah. there, oh, man. Oh, dude. That's the black blessing. girl magic is kicking my butt up in this joint. Yeah, man, well, congrats, sure. man. Congrats, man. Thank and, you. And, and prayerfully, your wife has a wonderful healthy pregnancy and you guys you know whatever the baby is just pray that it's healthy and functional and that's it man. absolutely that's it. absolutely how about you how are you in the fam oh everybody's good just came back from vacation uh went to fort nice. lauderdale it felt like uh i was in a bill and ted excellent adventure video <laughs> it was just, it was kind of crazy i've never i've never seen that before what you know you because when I grew up spring break was like and i didn't and mind you people are gonna watch this i didn't know that it was spring break so yeah. I was just going, and then all of a sudden, when I got there, it was like, "Oh, this is this spring break." So mm. if, if people hear my dog, I mean, somebody's at my door. But anyway, we yeah. gonna keep on rolling. Okay. So, um, but yeah, it was cool, man. We had a good time. Did some jet skis. It's always nice. good to just get away from your environment so you can kind of see where you want to be. Because I want to eventually move to a to a place where the weather's a little bit better. I'm not sure about you. Some um, do. Right. Do you like the cold? Like, is that? Have you, have uh, you just pretty much said, question. have you removed all of your African spirituality and said, <laughs> now I am going to be a cold I am, dude? <laughs> I am a Nordic Negro. That's what oh, I am. Oh, man. I, Come yeah, on, I don't, okay? I don't mind the cold, man. I, I born and raised in Minnesota, man. Like the temperatures here in any given, you know, winter can get below zero for sure. Like negative 10, negative 13, like that. I, I don't, I'm not outside when it's that cold, but right, like right, right, the, right, I'm right. so used to it. It's nothing. It's nothing. So, you know, when I go to when I go to warm spots, like one of my like my second home, I always say is Houston because I go to Houston almost every year. Houston is dope too. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I be down there sweating like a dog, man, because I'm not used <laughs> to that type of heat. And they and they're, they're used to it, so ain't nobody sweating but me. My friends yeah, be laughing yeah. at me and stuff. They call me Penguin Man and all types of stuff, man, because I'm just dripping. But you know, so I'm used to the cold, and I got to learn that new, that different, that southern heat's different, man. That's a different yeah, type of animal. It's different. It's zero different. But yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm ready to roll. I think we got a topic that uh, uh <sighs> I think we got a topic, man. <laughs> I think we got a topic. Yeah, man. So today's topic is on black men, black men, and violence, black men and anger, black men and the pain that we go through, and how we express that pain outwardly. And unfortunately, this conversation is coming on the heels of losing the legendary hip hop artist, rapper, DMX, man. Unfortunately, DMX has passed, as many folks know by this point. Um, and already, folks are trying to cancel DMX for being the man that he is. <laughs> been, he, um, he was here 50 years, Brandon. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know how cancel culture work. We gonna wait till you die. Or wait till you pop in, oh. and then we're going to get you out of here completely, which is a sad thing. Um, you know, nobody's perfect. And I, and, I, and I don't believe we should be judging uh, folks and trying to eliminate their catalogs and stuff, uh, which is a very emotional response, especially because this man's leaving behind a lot of children and, and people who depended on him financially. And the sales and things that he's going to get are going to go to those folks. So canceling him is ultimately hurting his family. But we don't think of that. We think of he needs to just be eliminated. And then I'm thinking about how him and the things that he experienced and his creativity and his craft has created opportunities for other people. But that doesn't matter to some folks. So I mean, you, I mean, let's be real. If people think about it, when DMX came out, and I mean, and, and so I grew up in New York City. So a lot of this, I was. Um, <laughs> 
I always tell people about hip hop is like New York, as you know, is like the ground zero of everything. But when you're on the streets, like I remember specifically when we were on the streets and we might be going to buy mixtapes and all you heard was DMX and it was DJ Clue and it was the locks and it was all these other guys that were out and it was, it was incredible. Uh, but let's be real. Def Jam made a, Def Jam was on its way down. Right. When DMX and Jay got in that label yep. and then the rest is history. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Cause they didn't know what was going to happen. LL is like, it was a very pivotal moment in the, in the business in general. So Kevin Lyles, Russell Simmons, um, Leor Cohen, all these guys made a ton of money off this guy. Like yeah. he was a bread making machine for about yeah. a 10 year period, 10 year run. So I think people need to keep that in, um, people need to just keep that information in the back of their minds. And also I know we're probably, this is an easy segue into it. If you look at the documentary that mm -hmm. BET did on him, in his life, Brandon, I think it's incredible that he even had any sort of level of functionality and success. Mm. When you think about my mom, I mean, the story is public now, but my mom yeah. took me to a, I guess a foster center or a children's mm -hmm. center, whatever it was. And, and mm -hmm. he's like, oh, it's nice here. And five mm -hmm. minutes later, his mother just leaves. Like gone, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just out the door mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then in and out the foster in and in and out of the foster care system, and we know in this in this planet right where we are, all that right. anti blackness, the messages, the trauma. Who knows? You and I both know. Right. Who knows the things that were happening to him in those mm -hmm. places, the experiences, mm -hmm. and then when they look at him, like why is that the music angry? Right. See, that baffles me. Right. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is the music angry? We're talking about a guy that mm -hmm. grew up wanting to wanting to stick up people because he felt that he was abandoned. So right. he had a taken mentality. And the reason why I bring that up is because I find my buddy, um, my buddy grew up in Washington, DC and, and he grew up in a real tough part, Anacostia. And he told me, he said, Aaron, I'm a success. I own a business. And he said, listen, nobody wants to hear this. The yeah. majority of the guys that come out of those neighborhoods are not me. Yeah. They're not. Very true. They don't make it. Yeah. He's like, a lot of guys don't make it. And so Everybody sees a few success stories, Brandon, but based upon our numbers, a lot of black men that are in those environments become products of it. Um, yep. It's almost like a it's almost like a cage, and it's like they're it it's is. like a it's like a little gladiator ring, and they're just fighting because they've been encapsulated in that. And nobody looks at DMX like that. People talk right. about his addiction. I don't know. I, I know people that have struggled with drug addiction and different addictions for years of their life. I don't know how it feels to get addicted to crack when you're 11, 13 mm -hmm. years old. Right. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know how hard or how difficult that is. And, mm -hmm. and I guess the other part of it is that, and I want you to speak to this is the balance between understanding did Earl Simmons have some personal responsibility? Absolutely. But yeah. we can't not show empathy towards this black man because he still struggled. Right. That's the, that's the part that I have an issue with. Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. And <laughs> it's sad because when do we ever get to show sympathy for black men unless they are literally in a child in a very childlike sympathetic state? What, what, what I mean is like they ha we have to be physically crying and almost in a boyhood state for men to even get empathy from anyone, including or dead, black or men. Or dead, or dead. Even then, I don't, <laughs> even right. then, you're I don't right. even yeah, think, you're right. yeah, you're right. I mean, to be honest, I don't even think we respect black men when they die. I mean, that's part of our conversation mm. today is it's an expectation for black men to be dead or mm. in prison or to be abusers or these things that are always negative. And we don't always look at the full context of what's happening. Like you said, DMX, he's gone through foster care, you know, I've seen I've seen uh, reports. I haven't found anything directly from him, and might have I might have to go do some lyrical dissection. But mm -hmm. he's talked about or apparently he's talked about being sexually abused, which yeah, is he a did. huge thing that mm -hmm. we don't talk about. Um, we talk about the addiction, like why? How do people become addicts? They're usually dealing with pain, and the drugs just become a way to cope. And then the drugs are addictive, and they need those things over and over and over again to continue to cope with the pain that they've experienced. But again, we don't talk about these things because black men are supposed to just have it all figured out. We're not supposed mm. to feel anything. We're mm. not, we don't, we don't deserve empathy. That that's one of the thought processes that goes through. That is very true. That is very people. true, Brandon. That and and we, we need to be empathetic. We need to understand that he's a human being just like anybody else. 
even though he associated himself with, with being a dog, that doesn't mean that he was one or we should even treat him that way. And, and DMX and is that's, that's a Welsing moment right there. Man, I mean, th- yes, it is. <laughs> that's a, that's Cow, a, cowbells. Cowbell, right, right, right. <laughs> Shout out to Gus T. Renegade, man. But, yes, sir. You know, you know, for me, this is this week has been a very interesting week where people mm. have rallied to really support this man. And as he went into that, you know, that coma or that veg or that vegetable state that he mm-hmm. was in. And and then the, the the automatic backlash, and now let's just cancel them. Like it really says a lot about how much we value the gifts that people give us, even when they've gone through pain themselves. And how in, in our current time, in this cancel culture that we're in, that we can just take the, the negative elements, the, the, the negative pieces of somebody, and just throw away everything else that they've done. DMX has helped thousands of people deal with suicidality. Mm-hmm. He's gotten people through college. He's gotten people to motivate themselves to lose weight. Like, think about his music. <laughs> yeah. I mean, DMX right. can, That's real. That's I mean, real. He can be credited for putting people in relationships. Like, people go to a DMX concert, they meet one another, now they're together. <laughs> like, right, we, right, gotta, right, we have right. to look at, we can't just be so narrow-minded and narrow-focused wow. on the negative things that, pe- that happen to folks. Um, even if they talk about being, vi- even if they per- perpetrate violence, we have to see folks right. from a from a full context. Now, there are punishments that come with negative things. Like you can't just be murdering people. But DMX ain't never murdered nobody, from what we know. He never told us that. Right. Like, publicly, and, and, yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Publicly, <laughs> no. I, I can. We can't speak on it, but what we yeah. know, absolutely, absolutely. And and, and I and I believe if if if, if my information is correct. The things that he has done, he has been um, held accountable for those things. Like he's gone in and out of jail and things of that nature. So again, at some point we have to have some humanity for black men because when we don't have humanity for black men, black men develop identity and culture around being inhumane. And then we start to see the violence show up in our communities. Um, like we see, you know, today, you know, unfortunately during COVID-19, one of the things that spiked up mm. has been yeah. the violence in the community. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it sounds bizarre, but just one little thing, uh, one <laughs> pandemic that has that has limited resource, eliminated a lot of resources for people, a lot of opportunities and time to do things has resulted into violent acts that have taken place. Carjackings are up all across the nation. Uh, murders are up all across the nation of young black men. And it's unfortunate, but it is a reality. Yeah, I think that um, I think one thing that that the black I think we talk about it, and uh, Mr. Fuller always talks about that black community word, and and I've, I've been trying to get away from it, but I just can't, <laughs> so I'm just going to use black it. <laughs> the black collective or whatever. I don't think we still have a fully have fully understood the ravage, ravage, and I and, I, and your mentor has talked about it, the yeah. ravage impact that crack cocaine had on black on 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 just our culture yes. if you even think because dmx all these rappers that everybody wants to cancel are all products of their environments Bingo. every single one of them yep our these family. are the environments that 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 they grow up in you know some of these rappers are they just making stuff up yeah possibly but a lot but a, a lot of these guys you don't want to go live in yonkers i know where he grew up i grew up in mount <laughs> vernon i did not grow up there and I'm mm-hmm. telling you, Mary J. Blige and them, they grew up in the same environment. Dude, we're talking mm-hmm. about poverty. Yes. We're talking about a different level. We're talking about some of these places of third world countries where mm-hmm. nobody even wants to go. But nobody talks about that. Everybody talks about the fact that, oh, they are able to make it out. But what about the thousands of Black men that are still in there? Like I said, it's like a cage. But right. that cocaine and that crack epidemic has produced so many things, rightly and wrongly, that people love about culture and mm-hmm. people hate about culture Absolutely. you know people love saying the Migo song whip it like a stir fry well yeah. they're not talking about um whipping miracle whip they're talking right. about whipping <laughs> cocaine right that's what we're talking about so it's good right. in an entertainment standpoint when these black men are entertaining us right. but when they're actually dealing with the violence in their neighborhoods it's it's a real reflection on on us as a collective and truth be told brandon we have not we have not responded to it properly because I'll go with Dr. Welsing says is that I don't even believe that we that we understand that we are in an anti-black war. Right. We don't even believe it. Like it's almost like we've adapted. This is just who we are. 
and yes. this is not who we are, but it's almost like some of us are trying to fight this fight through the system, anti-blackness, white supremacy, whatever people want to call it, mm-hmm. not realizing that even when we're fighting, you're constantly being assaulted. assaulted. You're constantly yeah. being assaulted. So mm-hmm. it makes it very difficult um, not that not to say that we can't win some of these battles and things of that nature, but it makes it very difficult to even understand where we are because some of these some of these brothers, man, they don't saying that they don't have a shot is an understatement, friends. And I'm just gonna say mm. it. Mm. Saying they don't have a shot is just an understatement because they have become a permanent underclass, as Dr. Claude mm. Anderson talks about. And mm-hmm. there's a segment of people in this country that nobody cares about, and mm. black men are at the top, that we are at the top of that, the top, mm-hmm. not the bottom, that right. nobody cares about. We don't care if you kill each other. We mm-hmm. don't care about your mental health. We don't care any of that because yeah. you are prone to violence. You're prone to abuse. You're prone to this. You're prone to that. You're prone to that. And that's why we need spaces like this so we can talk about some of these issues because a baby is three years old. A baby comes out and a baby's just crying. Yeah. A baby doesn't grow up and say, my name is Earl Simmons and I got a dog. Give me all your money. Yeah. How do right. we get from that to that? Right. Nobody, everybody wants to talk about he's a stick up kid. Nobody wants mm. to talk about how the baby got to the stick up kid. Yeah. And that is something that we, to me as a black collective, we have not examined. How do we get to that point? Because black violence, black male violence is a problem. Period. Absolutely. It, Absolutely. It's, a, it's a problem. But rehabilitation hasn't done it. Mm-hmm. It's not going to do it in this system of anti-blackness. That's not going to be the cure. To me, it's obvious, yeah. especially when these guys get thrown back into that environment and they just going through the same cycle. So there's so many different ways that we can go with this. I guess the first question that I have for you today is prone to violence. Um, why do black men and women believe the anti-black media? that is put out about black men with violence. Why, why do because to, to me, that's what it is. It's because I don't believe everything that the anti-black media says about me, but why yeah. are, why, and, and to me, Brandon, you correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that as a black collective, that's what we believe about black males. We may not say mm-hmm. it, but our behavior and our actions, that's how we are. So why do we as a collective believe those things about our brothers, about our sisters, about our fathers, about our uncles, about our children. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I think we believe it because we don't have a high expectation for black men to do anything different. Mm. I think the expectation, the bar is so low for black men to do anything different, but be an abuser, but be a menace to society, but be a, uh, a, a adjutant, something that just gets on our nerves. Mm. That that's we haven't elevated the expectation for who black men are, what they should be. The only time the expectations elevated is when we talk about dating preferences. So a black man needs to have six figures and be <laughs> and be a cover thug, drive a nice car, have his own. That's the only time. <laughs> the only time. The only time the expectations elevated is when it comes hey, to dating. Other, other than that, it's uh, <laughs> other than that, it's just like good luck, black man. I mean, good luck, black boy. Really, because by the time you're like 13, a lot of black boys are just kind of on their own and trying to figure it out. Well, they're not on their own per se. The cultivation of black boys has stopped. There is no rites of passage for the black boy. The black boy is out here in the world trying to figure it out, and then he gets with other black boys, and they're doing what they believe to the media to be Mm. black masculinity and black manhood right and that unfortunately leads to a lot of dysfunctional things and dysfunctional behavior so one the expectation is really low two i think that one of the reasons why we believe what the as you termed it the anti-black media paints this picture for us is that we have enough um uh i don't want to say evidence that's not what it is but we have enough experiences within mm. our own families and circles very true, to kind of say true. to kind of say oh it's right or it proves it right even though we also have enough experiences to say that's not true yes that is very but very we don't true. look at that because we are conditioned to always focus on the bad things that black boys say we don't look at that uncle or that father or that brother who is doing the right thing and who is on their own path you know, we focus on the one that's that's causing all the problems, kind of like what you know the term of the squeaky wheel gets the grease type of thing. Yeah, that's what yeah, ends yeah. up happening. And unfortunately, when you say that we're at the top of the bottom of that kind of hierarchy yeah. of yeah, you know gotta, this gotta, permanent undercut, 
Yeah, gotta I coin gotta, that. I, yeah, I gotta yeah. coin that, man. I gotta coin you better, that. You better get yeah. it. You better coin it. <laughs> yeah. The, wrong, the right person get this. It's gonna be a book before you know it. <laughs> it ain't gonna be me though. I'm gonna right, give you credit. Right, right. But but you're but you're right on that because think about this, man. When it comes to literacy, we have we have the worst literacy in this country. When it comes to homelessness, black yes. men are the most homeless in this country. No one talks about that. Nothing. No. <laughs> Brandon, real quick, I, no, but I want I mean to cut you off. But no, when I travel to any major city, like when I go, it's specifically tourist destinations, the level of black male homelessness is so high. Dude, if any, people listening to this, you go to Atlanta, you know what I'm talking about. You go to Baltimore, you know what I'm talking about. You go to New York, you know what I'm talking about. San Francisco, LA, Dallas, or all these places, black male homelessness is super high and nobody says anything. No. It's like they're forgotten people. I didn't mean to cut you off. Keep going. Keep going. No, no, you're good. Yeah. Guess what? You're just talking about people on the street. We got black men bouncing from house to house, couch mm. to couch, and families too that are technically homeless. I mean, in the in the manosphere or the the YouTube male um, kind of circles that we created, there's the term that's been floating around homosexuals, or you have black men who are who are finding shelter by sleeping with women like mm -hmm. this has been a common practice that is a real in, thing in, in our collective so we're not going to use community in our collective <laughs> for like 25 30 years where you just start having these dudes just bouncing around and then you have our relationship standards and i'm not trying to make this all about relationships but that's important because when we talk about building community that foundation of relationships is very important but you have the expectation that we are not going to develop families that has been brought down so low mm. that you have women who are like, if, if all I can get out of him is some good sexual pleasure, then, hey, I'll take that, that because that I got adequate. everything. Right. Yes, because I have everything yeah. else that I need. I already have my children. I have a good job. I have my own house. I have my own car. I pay my own bills. But you ain't got your own phallus. And some some of them do, but they want the, the real thing and not the fake thing. So what ends up happening is they just take a little bit. I'm serious, man. I'm, right, I'm right, just right. keeping it real. Right. So right, the, right. the expectation has been so low. So look, well, like I said, literacy, homelessness. Talk about health. I mean, Black men just being healthy, we don't have the best health standards. And then I think another reason for why it's so easy to accept that narrative from the anti-Black media is that Black men have not participated in patriarchy. Now, that's going to sound crazy to some people, but when it comes to this you going, you going Dr. Space, Curry on me, Brandon? You going Dr. Curry on me? <laughs> a little bit. Just a little, we have, okay, okay. Just, just a let's little, go there. Let's now go there. think about this. I'm not saying patriarchy is the system that we should even be participating in. But in this current environment that we live in, we know that patriarchy is what pushes this. We have not been allowed to participate in this patriarchal nature, which focuses around what? Which focuses around capitalism, which has a huge role in, um, in academia and education as well. Mm -hmm. And also has a huge role in politics. Black men are typically absent in those three areas. That way we don't have a voice in those spaces. So what ends up happening is since we don't participate and other other ethnic groups of men do, that's why we end up in the situation that we're in today. So I'm not saying that patriarchy is right. That's not what I'm saying. Because I honestly don't think that it's an effective um, system in general. But it is the system that we currently have, and we right. don't actively participate in it. And unfortunately, we don't get the benefits from it. And, but we do have negative behaviors that we ha that we do, right? We, there are things that Black men are doing that we should not be doing collectively, unfortunately, that end up feeding this system due to our dysfunction. So that's when we end up going to jail or we need help from these social service organizations or agencies. Um, we, are, we are not economically astute. That way our businesses don't float to the top. We don't really create, a, not collectively, we don't create Fortune 500 companies or we don't create these things. We don't create real estate companies connect, collectively. Some of us do, but the masses, that's not the push, that's not the focus. We don't even think of career paths as black men. We think of hustles, like how am I gonna get fast money? We need a whole mindset and, co and cultural shift for black men and that involves help of black women to, in order to do it. But as black men, that is our main responsibility is to shift that. So I'll pause there on the answer uh, and let you get a follow up. Yeah, um, my dad once said, uh, my dad, so people that know me, my father is a been involved in ministry for, I mean, 40 plus years of his life. And this is coming from a Christian minister. Mm -hmm. He says the reason why black men love the church so much and the 
quote unquote power that you look like you have is because sometimes in this society, that's the only place where you even had a voice. Yep. That's why you might see Deacon Johnson saying, sticking his chest out every single Sunday and saying, hey, I'm the I'm on the usher board or a pastor, because mm -hmm. where else is that? Where else does he have power mm -hmm. in this part of the world? Right. Where, where else do you have any power? The black church. But that becomes that's another that's another podcast in itself, because <laughs> what have we actually produced in those places? We have different. Mm -hmm. We have we definitely have some black pastors out there. My father, one developing programs, mentoring mm -hmm. black men and women. But the majority of the results that we see, like you said, we're not developing things that are involved in the community. And I want to go back to a point right. that where you said is that us and I and I take everything as a responsibility of black men regardless yep. of the war that we're in it's our problem it's our job to solve these problems yep. if we don't create infrastructure and within our own communities and within our own collectives and within our own families what you see around us right now is exactly what you get yep because mm -hmm. you didn't we didn't create jobs for young men to go to we didn't create high income opportunities for young men to go to we didn't create, I'm not talking about a center. And that's one thing I'm not <laughs> knocking, bro, I'm not knocking brothers for doing this stuff, but that's the immaturity that even I have had yeah. about what we should actually be doing. And you have to create an economic base for people to go to. Every place on this planet, Brandon, <laughs> when you see poverty, yeah. poor people are fighting. Yep. Poor people are fighting. Poor yep. people are killing each other. Poor people are mad at each other. That's what they do. Poor people are fighting for resources. So what you see in the United States is not totally different than any other place on the country. And I even say in some parts of, of middle white America, this is what you see. This is what men do across just, um, and then somebody, we have an academic, uh, we'll have an academic um, come in. Hold on, my son, you don't kid. It's upstairs, man. I'm doing a podcast. My son's walking on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you see our kids, they like recall um, just across all platforms. That's what you see. Races, things of that nature. That's yep. exactly what you see. You see poverty. That's what people do when they poor. Right. They fight each other. And and to me, that that part has always been to me the most surprising thing. Like, oh, why are they acting like that? Right. You ever not had no money? Yeah. <laughs> Being broke is the root of all evil. No, man. no, seriously. You never not had you never not had no money and try to go across town and 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 literally somebody, not only are they not yeah. gonna help you, but you're the enemy. Yeah. You take out mm -hmm. that anger on the people that are directly involved in. And that's another right. thing I want to talk about is that our energy is very misdirected, yes. but anti but anti-blackness and white supremacy has done a masterful job, Brandon. Yes. I, this is masterful job mm -hmm. at making sure that energy is not directed towards and, uh, the proper sources. Yep. And that to me is something because whenever I see these videos, I don't know about you, man, I watch a lot of hip hop mm -hmm. and um, I love hip hop, but I see these videos, Brandon. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first one I saw uh, when Drill first came out and this mm -hmm. is right on par with black male violence. Yep. And Chief Keef Chief had, Keef. Um, yep. Chief Keef came out mm -hmm. with the song, They Don't Like. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing all these black males yep. in this video, shirts off, shirts off yep. hundreds, thousands of them, yeah. with guns and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there yeah. saying to myself, that's, that's looks like, that looks like a family. Mm -hmm. That looks like a collective. Yeah. It also looks like misdirected energy. Yeah, absolutely. It also looks like misdirected energy. And the key and for us as black men is how do we direct that just a, a, a quick shift in that energy. Because we all know what happens when that energy stops being anti-Black. Yeah, It goes towards something different. Yep. But even as a collective, I don't even think we wanted to go there because we're scared about what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. I think we're petrified mm -hmm. about it. So I don't know if we're yeah. ready to actually make that shift. But but just what my dad was saying, not developing, and those are the things, not being able to say, Brandon is having trouble in school and you want to drop out. Okay, Brandon, you know what? I own an auto dealership. I own a company here. We develop prosthetic legs or something like that. You can come work here. You can come work yep. at the plant. The plant is what we built, not yep. what someone else built. The plant is what we built. So I have an opportunity, even if you're on the street for come develop this something, to come develop yourself as a man. What happens with us is we get on the street and guess what we're doing? Because we don't own nothing. We're looking yeah. for jobs. Looking for right. We're looking for something because we have not done a good job as a collective 
of not developing things, but also, yes, somebody's going to watch this video. I understand that there were <laughs> obstacles in us doing right. that. I get right. both sides. As Dr. Welsing says, it doesn't matter. We have to build it. It don't matter what the problem is. So I no, could go off on a tangent, man. And no, just, but, you, um, you're right on point, man. It, it's, I, it's, it's rough, man. I'm going to say something that's a little controversial. Again, because you typically do that once a week. Now I'm messing with you. <laughs> I'm never gonna get a blue check on anything. Nah, man. you ain't you ain't never getting verified for nothing. Nothing. But what one of the things that, that we have to be honest about in our collective, our community, is that there's a lot of money that gets pumped into helping us. But culturally, we have not figured out a way to utilize those things to advance. What do I mean by this? As somebody who's been in the social service field, the mental and mental health field mm -hmm. since 2007, I've seen major projects come through the Twin Cities, millions of dollars year by year, where all you have to do is show up, you get an accelerated certificate, you could be making 50 to $80,000 within a year if you just do a program and black men won't show up. And the re and, the, and it's crazy, we'll, they'll give you They'll give you gift card. They'll try to bribe you with gift cards. They'll give you bus passes if you don't have transportation. They'll give you gas cards if you have a car. They'll help you get your car fixed if it don't work. It's like all these things that we set up and still a lot of black men do not show up and utilize those things. And the reason for that from what from my standpoint is because culturally we haven't understood that that is an opportunity for us to build something bigger mm -hmm. so we don't we don't value that because we haven't we haven't been cultivated to value those types of opportunities we're, we're too focused on hitting a lick or getting something quick and making and making making a move out of something that's little versus seeing the opportunity to big build something that's bigger and i say that's controversial because no one talks about we know it especially black professionals, we know it, but no one wants to say it because then it sounds like you're blaming the victim or it sounds like you're talking bad about the community, but it is a reality, man. I've seen, man, I, I have developed programs where I, where I will pay <laughs> young black folks, 17, 18, 19 years old, barely have a high school diploma. We'll, get, we'll pay for you to get a GED. All you gotta do is an eight week program We'll get you a, a certified, um, you know, engineer, certified welder, certified whatever, something that you can just take a career and live your life. You can be an independent contractor and live a life. But culturally, since they since they haven't seen it or it doesn't sound attractive or it's just not, it's, or it's too hard, it's too much hard work because you got to get up every day. You got to talk to these people. You got to go inside of this. You got to weld that, like, we haven't conditioned our young people to understand that we have to develop skill sets in order to maintain in this world. And a skill set can be various different things. It can be talking. It can be, you can become a radio host, right? Like Charlemagne. It could be using your hands. It could be, um, it could be creating uh, different products or even it could be like marketing. It could be a lot of different things that are skills, but black men, young black boys don't get skill development. They get life skills thrown at them, but they know how to live. They know how to survive. That's yeah, what they've that's been real. doing for so long. Mm -hmm. They real. need to have skills that produce revenue, <laughs> skills that build careers, skills that are going to lead to wealth generation. So we can't, we always get stuck on things like financial literacy. Well, hell, financial literacy is good when you're making money, but when you ain't making no money, what's the point? Yeah. And that, that, Mm. This is this is the step mm. that we don't want to take and that we don't want to talk about to really start helping black boys. We have to shift the culture. White supremacy is going to continue to be effective. Anti-blackness is going to continue to work until culturally we start saying and we start saying we're going to be intentional. We're going to have the, the boys that are more career focused, focus on careers. The boys that aren't focused on skill development so that they can get career focused and they can start to build a life. Everybody is not meant to work a job. And to be honest with you, a lot of the jobs that are available for a lot of black boys who don't have a lot of education are starting to be replaced with automation and robots. So what happens once we start fully fully going with this automated world? What happens going, to the black we're going with that, Brandon? We're going what there, happens to the black male who has little skills when he's competing with a robot that is cheaper? That ain't gonna give me no talk back. That ain't gonna cause me no problems. All I gotta do is reprogram it or swap it out for another one. I don't gotta pay no pensions. <laughs> I don't gotta pay no insurance, no benefits, none of that. All I gotta do is just get another robot to do the same thing that you can do. We are at a critical point where we need to shift our culture 
Otherwise, more black men will end up being in prison or more black men will end up being dead due to not having enough options. And also another thing that we have to be very, very mindful of, black men who made a living on the streets utilizing drugs, that's gonna change. With marijuana being legalized, it is gonna open up mm-hmm. a black market, yeah. but it's gonna change the way that black market has been. So I don't know too many black men who got plugs with pills or no pharmacists, <laughs> but that, that's, the, that's the only drugs you're gonna be able to get on the street pretty soon. Right. Because it, it is it is getting I mean the drug game ain't what it was in the eighties and the nineties right it, it's it's dried up to a certain extent so we're at, we're we're in a space and place where even the street lifestyle is going to be reduced just due to how the society is changing and I don't think we're really talking about it or really focusing on it there are a lot of black boys that are developing right now into nothing not even the streets the streets ain't even there. That's yeah, why you're yeah, seeing things yeah. like carjackings go up because there yeah. ain't no other opportunities to make no fast money. Yeah. Pretty soon you're going to start seeing black boys selling stuff, selling themselves on OnlyFans because they ain't going to have too many other options. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I say that in a joking manner, but I'm dead serious. Like, we have you to ain't think lying. about this. You ain't we lying, have to think Don't about let me this. lose my job. Shoot, I'm getting popping. <laughs> <laughs> you got <laughs> Let man. it dangle doing the cabbage patch, <laughs> like ESTG said. Oh okay. <laughs> man, Brandon. Oh my God. You know, it's when you're saying all of that, I, I just keep thinking to myself, everything you're saying is just hundred percent true, but how do we, oh, and this is, and I don't want to make sure I lose this thought. Um, Go for it. Viewers are going to watch some of this content and say, mm-hmm. you guys are talking about a segment of the population that doesn't apply to me. Streets, crime, sure. things of that nature. I want to remind people of this. You don't <laughs> like Aaron, you don't like statistics. The majority of black people in this country live in urban centers. Yes. Let me repeat that one more time. <laughs> the majority of black people in this country live in urban centers, right. which means they live in cities where yeah. this stuff is happening. So you might be the albatross to where you live in a suburb and that's not you. Yeah. The majority of black black men and black men and women, they live in urban centers. They live yeah. in Baltimore. They live in the Atlantas. They live in the New Yorks. They live in the Jerseys because um, due to the Great Migration, we get that yeah. book. Isabel Wilkerson. She yep. talked about how we all got into these places. So the reason why we're talking about that is because that's where a lot of us are, and that's a yeah. pet peeve of mine, Brandon. I'll be mm-hmm. honest with you: is Go sometimes those of us forget about nothing. First of all, if we're still in the system of racism, white supremacy, if we're still in a system of anti-blackness, none of us have made anything. Yeah. <laughs> let's go full let's go full let's mr go. fuller <laughs> yeah what have you actually made what have you actually done so you have created a life for yourself that, that you are totally immune to anti-blackness that's a yes or no question the no. answer to that is going to be no right. so if you know for a fact that you're still in this system i it i t- i it bothers me brandon that when people become somewhat whatever they want to call successful or they are compensated in this system that all of a sudden they start to look at the people that are still in these urban centers that they are not them. Right. That was those kids that are in my urban that are in those urban centers were my father in 1947. Right. That was living in High Point, North Carolina. Or yeah. your mom, you see what I'm saying? It's yep. just a twist, it's just a change of the time. And we become so immune. And we believe all this stuff and we look at these people and we look at these circumstances, everything is the same. It's just different now. Yeah. But the same way you don't want to grow up in South Jamaica, Queens, or you don't want to grow up in, in the streets of Atlanta, you would not have wanted to grow up in these rural southern towns right. um, 70 years ago with no war, with no running water. You, can, you right. see what I'm saying? It's just a different part of the system. Yes. And we have to have empathy because... If you don't, the wolves are the wolves are looking for people to eat, man. A buddy of mine always says that. And if you don't feed the wolves, you become the food. <laughs> and I don't think people realize. I'm serious, man. I'm saying yeah. no, no, we don't I, know. We don't know, Brandon. We don't know anarchy in this country. I, yeah, we sure don't. We, we do not we know do. real. We don't know. No, <laughs> we do not know real anarchy. No. What it looks yeah. like. Go to Brazil. Yeah, we we don't. 
We don't know. We don't. And we think what we seen on January 6th was anarchy. That that was a man, that was a spectacle. <laughs> that, that was that theater was some foolishness, <laughs> man. That was absolute That's not, foolishness. We we don't want to get to that point where we have to make choices on am, to survive. Am I gonna have to take a life of a of a young person in order to survive? But we can we can't get there. And I don't want to sound so fatalistic and no, black, no, no, we're know. not saying, but we have to be realistic but, about where but we, we are. We do, yeah. we do. Cause because what's gonna end up happening is we're gonna reach a critical mass on um, poverty and, and things are gonna have to change. And even if you are somebody who's quote unquote made it and you've moved out of the hood and you got or you're middle class or whatever, maybe you live in the hood and you have mm-hmm. that middle class income or you you have a career. You, I guarantee you still have family members who have not achieved the 100%. same thing. Yeah, you man. It's just, yeah. There's, it's, it's, it's very rare to not. It's very rare. I mean, there are some black folks who, I mean, they have, they are in a whole different class and they just stay in that class. But for the most of us, that's not the truth. So to me, we do have to have a level of empathy. Like you said, we have to be able to support young black men. And I'm not saying not to support the girls because we, we get that European thinking where it's all or nothing. <sighs> What I'm saying is we do need, and just like that all these black too. girls are mm-hmm. getting these opportunities and they're getting funding to do all these things, we have to have the same for black boys. Because if you leave black boys behind, we're going to continue to have the violence that we have in our communities. We're going to have more DMXs, okay? We don't need any more DMXs um, to the certain extent where that pain has to turn into creativity to help motivate us. We right. need more folks black folks to build and cre- and to create things so that we have an establishment in this country or if we want to take it worldwide just in the world we we have to be able to look at trauma um not just have empathy for black boys but cultivate them to a place where we are developing careers we're having political influence we're having edu- uh, ec- um, economic development we're moving forward to education those things sound hard but they're not and they start with the foundation of building healthy families. And then the community has to be able to develop trust again, because we don't trust each other. Let's just keep it a hundred. Black folks don't trust each other because of the anti-blackness. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we don't have a strong community. We have to say collective because the trust factor for us has been shattered. And, and unfortunately, in order for us to develop that back, we're gonna have to have some raw, honest and objective conversations yeah. like what we're doing today. We're gonna have to be, tell the truth, even if it doesn't feel good and it makes you feel some type of way, that's not going to move the needle. We have to move the needle because automation's happening. We, we already started to see, we haven't even talked about this on this podcast yet. We're already starting to see how black people are being painted as the, the perpetrators of violence amongst Asian Americans. So now the other groups that we've been lumped with are starting to say, hey, you're victimizing us too. We are, we are slowly becoming the boogeyman over and over and over again. And we yeah. can't allow that to happen because what does that leave for our, what does that leave for our future and those little ones behind us? So I'm going I'm to pause there and let you get the final question off for today. Oh, or thought. man. Oh, man, we've been rolling. Um, <laughs> I don't even, man. I, how do, so I don't want to make sure we, I don't, we, I don't think we veered off too much, but with black male violence, a lot of it, in my opinion, um, because we are not inherently violent. Yeah. A, and I think, and that's one of the things that bothers me oh. is that, oh, black people are violent. I'm like, violent? inherently here no. who I, I don't and that's what mr and so this is why we got to talk about mr fuller brandon yes we have yeah. to talk about mr fuller yeah. so when mr fuller says the masters of violence mm-hmm. pookie and ray ray standing on the corner <laughs> shooting each other over a five dollar crack vial <laughs> has nothing on Not people close. that drop a bomb in hiroshima right. nothing right, right. No, no, zero Right. We did not invent the drive-by shooting. No. So in this part of the world, when they say inherently violent, you have to actually look at what we're talking about. We're talking about interpersonal community violence. Right. Interpersonal people and humans are violent amongst each other. And Period. poor people are going to be even more violent amongst each other because mm-hmm. they have a lack of resources. That's right. either true or false. And then when all of a sudden you start to throw in foreign substances bad health. I will constantly bring this up. I want people to Google this. There's an article on NPR and it talks about specifically that black people living in urban centers have less oxygen than their Mm. white counterparts because of trees. Trees. Yep. Brandon, 
Yeah. Trees. <laughs> Environmental racism, folks. So we're talking about people. So, so I want everybody, we're going to do a full 360. So now we're talking about black men in neighborhoods to where they don't have enough oxygen. They don't have enough resources. They have food deserts. They have yes. all these things going against them. And we are literally wondering why they have high rates of violence. Mm -hmm. When all you do is you look at this, you can put those same black males in different environments with different resources, with different things, and you're going to have entirely different outcomes. Yeah. I don't understand why we're not focusing on these environments and how to change them. But the environmental racism, that's something that's bothered me for years mm -hmm. when I learned about it, because I'm like, Brendan, I know I, I use a CPAP machine because I was mm. getting a lack of oxygen yeah. um, when I sleep. Yeah. So, and they're telling me it'll change your brain functionality. But we have yep. groups of black people living yeah. in neighborhoods yes. that are not getting enough oxygen. Yep. And now we're asthma, looking at asthma all and all the stuff. And no, and all of a sudden, why are they being dysfunctional? <laughs> these are the things that I want people to think about when you look at people in these environments. It's intentional for them to behave like this. Yeah, we could plant trees, y'all. I mean, we could we could plant trees, but these are things that we can just do. So anyway, to go back, that was a that was a that was a no, rant, man. That, that was um, great. Let me let me add and then let me add to that because mm -hmm. and I won't go on long. But what you're well, that goes back to my earlier point. We need to be cultivating young people to see that as something that's necessary and be very yes. Intentional. Yes. Because if you're not going to plant the trees in your neighborhood, another group will come in and plant it. But if they invest that in your neighborhood, they're going to want to stay there too. And so when gentrification go. happened, you can't get mad if you ain't investing in your community and you're not putting them trees in there because somebody else will come in and say, oh, there's a lot of opportunity here. And they will make, they will settle and colonize like they've been doing. Go ahead. No. Um, so with that being said, I think we obviously we want to leave people with number one solutions. I think the first thing is that I had to change this. Black people, we are not inherently dysfunctional. We not are enough. And sometimes we view each other with a European lens. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. And we don't like to admit that, but it's okay. But we also have to recognize some of our dysfunctional behaviors. And sometimes like Mr. Fuller says, we have to stay away from each other. We have to be very constructive about our, I mean, let's be, we have to be yeah. very constructive about our behaviors because it's like we're in a, we're in a rat hole. We are, and nobody wants to say it. We are, mm. every, nobody wants to admit it that we all have, and being in this part of the world, we have a certain level of poison mm. that we have developed for each other. And it's not intentional. We do love each other, but because we're in this system and everybody is trying to figure this thing out, um, it makes it very, very difficult. I was watching a video, man, yesterday. It was, uh, somebody said it to me, it was black conservatives versus black liberals, man. It was one, <laughs> I, I hate those dumps. <laughs> They're so dumb, dude. Um, and they started talking about <laughs> violence in the community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they started talking about all these things and the black conservatives were on there saying, yeah, you know, well, you have to, do this and, and you need to take a, a stance on your community and, and the liberals yeah. <laughs> did this and such and such. And I said, you know, most black people are probably conservative and very, and, uh, they are. Most black people are very conservative. Just don't know it. <laughs> but the difference becomes with me is that me being conservative does not mean that I agree to a European lifestyle. Bingo, yeah. Let me say that again. Yes. Me being conservative does not mean that I wholeheartedly agree that the European lifestyle is best. And as mm -hmm. humans, we need to, if this is our system. So let me just say globally, this right. is our system. Let's be honest. This thing ain't working. There's ain't a lot working. of fighting. It There's a them. lot of, it ain't working for them either. There's yeah. a lot of fighting, blowing people up, slaughters, bad food, capitalism, this dollar that we all think has so much worth. The, the value of it is going down. It is very mm -hmm. clear that this is not working for everybody. That's the issue that I have is that stop taking on these anti-black thoughts. Bingo. And all and, and then immediately the opposite is that, okay, I take on anti-blackness, so now I'm pro-European. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that's not working either. None of this is no. working. That's the issue that we have with the Jesse Lee Petersons, the Candace right. Owenses, the Larry Elders. You... You can't be somewhere to say two things are true. Is, yeah. is, is being on the left? No, yes, I think it's totally, I think that that is totally 
um, has not worked for black people. But I also no. don't think that taking on these European idea ideologies works for no. us either, because what does that do for our communities? Because a lot of yeah. no, because a lot of those ideas, Brandon, do not focus on helping people in those urban centers. It no. focuses on developing things outside, pull your right. bootstraps up, and all this kind of foolishness yeah. that people say all day long. Um, right. So, I just want to bring it up full circle: is that we have to we have to stop having anti-black thoughts about our own children, mm -hmm. about our own nephews, mm -hmm. about our own uncles. And we have to have a sense of empathy because sometimes all these people need is just, I, I care about you. Don't think that it won't work, man. It does. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it yeah. does. It, it just, but in just a train of thought, not being rude to one another. I remember you told the story a couple of weeks ago, just about the, um, the other mental health therapist that was looking at these young black males, oh, yeah. um, the woman that you were talking about <laughs> and saying yeah. they're just worthless. I mean, we are not a throwaway people, <sighs> but we have to get, we have to get into a mindset to understand how did these young men get here? Yeah. You know, you're not getting pop smokes. You're not no. getting all these, you're not getting this, all this, you're not getting all this gang stuff by accident. It's right. happening. These young people are calling out though. And here's the thing, the world loves them when they're being violent. Mm -hmm. We admire them. It's wonderful. I've yeah. never heard this, this part of hip hop, Brandon, I have never seen so many people know the lyrics to songs yep. that are literally all gang affiliated. Yep. The whole song is about Spot them, got them. The whole song <laughs> is about you doing all of that. I ain't yeah. doing it. It's gang affiliated. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it sounds really, really good. But when you watch the video, he's got an M16 and an Uzi. This is all, this is all, this is all wonderful until it comes to your doorstep. Right. And so we have to, we have to stop promoting some of it, but we also have to understand how they got there too. So we could, two things can be true. I understand right. why Pac was the way he was, but I also stand that we need to, uh, we need to elevate and try something different. But the number one thing that black males are not inherently, inherently violent. Right. We have environments and we have circumstances, we have traumatic experiences that have caused all of us to have a little bit of DMX in us, whether you like it or not. And how we work through those things, the first thing is empathy, but we also need to talk about DMX's mama. Mm -hmm. You wanna cancel DMX, you wanna cancel his mama? <laughs> Cause his mama did something that his mama did something that I don't even think, I mean, mm. you got kids, man. Yeah, I, man. A foster home, Brent, Brandon, a foster home and then just leaving. Yeah. yeah. It's mean, rough, man. I could go on on 10. The, the, the trauma. Yeah, yeah. Stop being anti-black towards your cousins, your sisters, um, your, your brothers, your uncles, your dad, everybody. We all have yeah. similar experiences. Have a little empathy, man. I'm gonna shut up, dude. Cause I'll go on for another week. <laughs> it, just, it bothers me, man. It pisses yeah. me off, man. It should. And I used to be, and I used to, and truth, this is the reason why I can say this because I used to be one of those guys that mm. would say him and them. And I still say dusty to this time, but I understand why they being dusty. Yeah. <laughs> I get why they being dusty. And right. so I have a little bit of empathy. Um, and last thing, man, we have so many other, I want you to finish it, but we have so many outlets for black men now with the internet to where we right. can talk about some of this stuff. I see you were in a room that I was in. You got guys like Anton Daniels that are out there. Yep. Even, even whether people like it or not. The, one of the reasons I started watching Kevin Samuels is because he was talking directly to me as a black male about being right. professional, right. earning income, stepping your game up and different things. I'm not talking about the relationship stuff. I'm talking right. about how Kevin originally started, started right. which was professional, black male, get your stuff together, throw the Jordans out the window, throw this mm -hmm. out the window. That's not how you're gonna develop and have an impact on your community. There's right. so many guys out there that have positive impact. We kind of have to start to shift as a society and saying, okay, we're gonna move away from some of the drill stuff and start promoting some of these young guys. Earn your leisures out there. Yep. These pro two professional black men talking about investments, we have proper examples, but we're going to have to start making some honest assessments about where we are, because otherwise it's just going to perpetuate in the circle. But the first place you can start is stop the anti-blackness in your own home. Period. Bingo. Bingo. Man, I mean, that's it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to add nothing to that. Like, like That's so important. Like we, we just have to look at how we are being anti-black amongst one another and then find out the strategies to stop doing it. You know, one of the things that I started doing 
uh, during COVID is I started donating money to like people that I seen doing Same constructive here. things. Like, and that's something I just normally, and, and and honestly, I think part of it was me being anti-black, like, oh, the, they, they're doing a fundraiser for this or they're doing that. Like, I just, <laughs> I would just keep my little coins to myself. Right, right, but right, right. Something right. told me, man, like, I, I got to just start supporting people. So if I see you doing something, I must just send you $25, $50 or whatever. Um, and, and I just do, started doing it. Like, I was never the guy on YouTube that was sending super chats, but I started doing that because I, in order to, to be about this, you have to support the folks that are putting their lives yes, on the line 100%. and mm-hmm. putting their career, some even their careers on the line by giving out co- constructive and um, objective information. So we have to think like that. So on that note, we're going to wrap up this fine episode of the Jagna and the Thinker. People, please be safe, be constructive, and be a thinker. We'll see you in the next episode. Peace. Peace. Thank you.